Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first edition of the Softball Canada webinar series for the 2021 season. My name is Frankie Billingsley, newest member to the Officials Development Committee, and as part of my portfolio, I will be hosting these webinars for the 2021 season. There will be two webinars a month with a common theme for each month. The February theme is the recipe for success. So thank you for joining me tonight for a fireside chat with four of the most amazing people in the game of softball. The four panelists, which will be making themselves available tonight, have a keen eye for talent and their resumes speak to their ability to enhance and grow an official's capacity and realize their potential. All four have played the game and they parlayed their talents into officiating. Their journey has resulted in supervising numerous championships and receiving a number of individual accolades. Our first panelist this evening that I will introduce is Bob Stanton, a fellow Canadian. Bob was the National Director of Umpires in Canada before taking on the role on the international level with the International Softball Federation, which is now the World Baseball Softball Confederation. While he has recently stepped back from his day-to-day -day duties as the WBSC Director of Umpires, a position he held for 12 years, he will continue to sit on the Rules Commission work on a few projects and continue as the umpire in chief at the Tokyo Olympic Games in 2021. Our next panelist is Caroline Stad Houders. And Caroline joins us from the Netherlands where she held the top spot as umpire in chief in what is now referred to as Softball Europe from 2012 to 2020. Caroline was the director of umpires from 2016 to 2020 for Softball Europe, and she is currently serving as one of the regional umpire coordinators for, for the WBSC softball division. Welcome, Caroline. Our next presenter is Kevin Ryan. Kevin is our neighbor to the south who served as the UIC for USA Softball World Cup for 13 years. He has served as UIC at least once a year at a national championship, and he's currently serving as the Director of Umpires for USA Softball, a position he's held since 2006. Welcome, Kevin. And our last speaker this evening is Pete Saunders, who began umpiring in 1997 and has qualified for his European Softball Federation designation in 2006. And he has received his ISF, now his WBSC license in 2013, and he has just started a new role as a softball WBSC Europe trainer. Um, he was the UK trainer since 2012 and will be our slow pitch representative tonight. Welcome to Pete and to everyone. Before we get started this evening, I just wanted to acknowledge that one of our previous national director of umpires, Wayne Brown, passed away early yesterday morning. Uh, Wayne was the director of umpires in Canada from 1994 to 2004. Wayne was instrumental in building the Softball Canada Umpire Program to what it is today. He's responsible for the modern certification program, creating the instructor evaluator program, and he was one of the driving forces behind Blue Convention. Wayne's impact is immeasurable. In short, he is the architect of our National Umpire Program. This was a direct quote from our National Director of Umpires, currently Jeff Whipple. There are many colleagues amongst us who owe a great deal to Wayne and would not be where they are today if it wasn't for his support, his guidance and his efforts. And I'd like to turn it over to Bob to make a few comments about Wayne as well. <clears throat> Thanks, Frankie. Um, Wayne was a really unique individual. He had a personality that was bigger than all outdoors. He was just uh, had an impact on people when he met them. He made people feel at ease um, and he was so encouraging. Uh, with the umpires that he met and dealt with. Um, never a negative thought, always looking for the positive. He was a visionary, not only in, in the softball programs, but in his own community. He has done so much for the St. Mary's First Nation in terms of economic development. Uh, um, it's just amazing what he was able to accomplish in a, in a, short, a short time. Definitely a true leader, a true friend. Um, uh, one would love to to uh, be able to have Wayne sitting in this fireside chat. He just had so much knowledge and had a great love of education. Love to share his thoughts on umpiring. I know that he will be looking in tonight on us and, and watching our, our chat, and I hope he finds this uh, to his liking. Frankie, back to you. Thank you so much, Bob. So uh, without further ado, I have... Uh pulled this amazing group of people together to hopefully help our officials 
build their own teaching programs and also for those out there that are going to be listening who are just about to start their journey. So my first question for each of you, and I think uh, with this first one, I'll start with you, Bob. What advice would you give for a first year umpire? I would probably start, Frankie, with the acronym of UMP, UMP. Um, I think individuals starting to umpire need to understand that the reason they took up umpiring may not be the same five years down the road. Their motivation may change. They may go from uh, umpiring as a part-time job or trying to give back to the game or uh, whatever else other reason you may find. But I think as they get into umpiring and if they stick with umpiring, they will find their motivation will become more personal. They will find that they are going to set goals for themselves. This is going to take four or five years before they get into that comfort level. But I certainly think that they would uh, they would move their they will see their motivation change of why they're because they've got into umpiring. Uh, the second thing would manage their expectations. You're a first year umpire. You know that it's going to be a rough road at times. You're not going to know all the rules. You're not always going to be in the right position to make the call. You're going to have good games. You're going to have some bad games. But remember, always look for that, that enjoyment that you find in umpiring. If you look for that, and if you always look to improve, um, learn from your mistakes and learn from others. Um, you know, study the rules, practice your mechanics, uh, and, and most importantly, watch others umpire. Watch those that have been doing the game for a while. Thirdly, pride. And that pride is both in yourself uh, and in umpiring in general. And you know that as a first year umpire, you can be as good as the best umpires in the world in two categories. One is appearance. If you look at your uniform as a, as a point of pride, if you dress properly, you can be as, look as good as the best umpires in the world. And if you hustle, and by hustle, I don't mean run like a crazy chicken with their head off, but move with purpose. Move with intent. And, if you, you know, best umpires in the world do that. They hustle, they move with purpose, they move with intent. And you can do that from day one. Just get that into your head. Um, be engaged, you know, and take your umpiring seriously. Thank you. Caroline, what would you tell a first-year umpire? Um, further to what Bob has said, I would... Um, to talk about engagement, I would advise them to um, become a member of the umpiring community. The umpiring community um, is so very valuable. Uh, I mean, we're doing a tough job, right? The role of an umpire. The, the only way you can understand more of what that role really means is by talking to other umpires, um, sharing the conflict that you may feel that you come across in the game. Um, and also very important relating to the enjoyment that Bob said is the camaraderie that you may find that it, you that you will really need to um, to let's say to stay in the game and to um, to to maintain yourself as an umpire and to grow as an umpire. That was that certainly one of the uh, aspects that I would uh, that I would advise them, and um, I, and and be patient. Be patient. Um, do not be afraid to make mistakes. All umpires are making mistakes. I mean, we are not robots, right? You have to accept that you make mistakes. But again, this community of umpires that you are a member of. Um, your colleagues, they can help you um, talk about the mistakes when you have made them. Because talking about mistakes, admitting mistakes will help you to learn from the mistakes. So, um, and then the thing that I really, really find it very important, especially for not only for beginners, but always be prepared. So be on time, make sure that everything that you need is ready, that you know what you're doing, that your equipment is in order. So preparation is really also one of the things that I think is very important. Yeah. Thank you. Kevin, 
what advice would you have for a first year umpire? Well, I would, I would stay along the, the line similar to my cohorts. I would also add the first year you umpire, don't get too caught up in the weeds. Go out and umpire. Enjoy umpire. You, your first year, you're learning. You know, go to go to camps. Go to the ability to learn when the when your when your teachers are putting on something to help you learn a little bit more. Go and listen. Um, my daddy taught me a long time ago that there's a reason the good Lord gave us one mouth and two ears. Listen twice as much as you speak. Because that first year, you really need to listen to people that know about umpire. But have fun. You're not going to really understand what softball Canada is or USA softball or softball Europe. Um, you're, you're not really going to be able to grasp that. And if you try to grasp it too soon in totality, it'll, it, it'll get in your head and you'll start doing things that you shouldn't be doing as a first year umpire. Uh, and talk to other umpires, watch other umpires. You, the best way to learn to umpire is just watching umpires. If you totally watch other umpires while they're doing your game, your game's over, sit back there and watch, uh, ask questions, uh, be prepared to be told some things you may not want to hear. Uh, like Carolyn said, we all, we all make mistakes. Um, just be prepared that, you know, you're going to make them learn from them and, and keep moving forward, but enjoy the ride. The first year of umpire can be a great time if you just put it in perspective and just have a good time. Thank you. Pete, what about you? Uh, very much the same that everyone said so far. Persevere. Uh, the first year of anything you start doing is a tough one. You've got a lot to learn, big, uh, huge learning curve. And every game you, you call, you'll build up experience and confidence, which is a big thing. Um, listen to your mentor. You have a good mentoring program in Canada, I know. They'll help you through the good times and the bad. Um, watching more experienced umpires call we've had already, ask them questions. See, you see them doing something that you're not sure why they did it, ask them the question. It might be they got it wrong, but you can learn from both the good things they do and if they do something that maybe they shouldn't have done. And, and again, you won't be perfect from the start. Be prepared. But if something doesn't go as well as you hope, um, use that experience to help you get better. Remember what it was that you didn't do so well and do it better next time. Um, yeah, the, the blue uh, team, we call it over here. Make sure you, you, you make sure you join other umpires when they're talking about games. As you say, you can admit mistakes you've made. You'll find other people admit the mistakes they, they've made because we all make mistakes. And you've got to be humble and accept that. And as you say, just learn from it. And as a big thing, as everyone said, enjoy it. It's fun. I like that theme, having fun. Caroline, I'll start the next question with you. What um, what advice would you have for somebody who's got a couple of years under their belt, like that person that's maybe at year five in the program? What advice would you have for somebody that's at that point in their in their journey? Yeah, I I I would use the year five or the couple of years. I'd look, use that as a metaphor. I would say for let's say the the stage where as an umpire you have you know you've done a number of games you have positioned yourself let's say in your umpiring community um you have um let, let's say made a name so to say um and now you're you're thinking hey where am i so the first thing that i would advise a number at that stage is to take the time to to look back on the journey that they have done so far uh, what has this journey brought me um i started doing this for what reason and is is it is this still the reason that i'm doing it or have i maybe found many more reasons um what have i learned in all these years um and probably also um, take the time to reflect on where, what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, um, and also what is my ambition in umpiring. And 
uh, I mean, not not every umpire um, uh, can be, you know, top of the world, be the best international umpire. There's nothing wrong with um, accepting that um, you may have taken out of this umpire everything so far that you wanted to, and that this is what you can do. But if you continue umpiring, and at a certain level, and you realize that that is about the level that is good for you, then always be aware to keep on e developing. Because even if you choose to stay at a certain level, you can still develop and you can still become the best you can be. And I think that is really important uh, to, to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Kevin, what would you say to a, to an official who's at that stage in their career at that five year five year point? <laughs> if you're lucky enough to stay in it for five years um, <laughs> and really get to love it like all of us did, now I think you're at a point in your career that you need to really make sure you're being involved in your organization understand what your organization does and how your organization does it. Um, I still remember when I was umpiring and after after five or six years, I didn't even know who ASA was. I mean, I was just umpiring. I didn't know who USA softball was. And the more I found out about it and the things that you could do, the people you would meet and, and really uh, understand what umpiring and the umpire family was all about. Um, now you're starting to get a really good sense. Uh, hopefully by now, like in our world, um, you know, we've got slow pitch, we've got fast pitch, we've got men's fast pitch, we've got women's fast pitch, we've got kids, we've got 16 inch slow pitch. Uh, you found that lane uh, of the game that you really love. Uh, and now you really want to get better, uh, stay in that lane. Um, listen to your mentors again in that lane. And I, I don't think I could say enough as I try to say to younger umpires, watch the game. You can learn so much by watching other umpires. National championships, you know, in today's world, you get a lot of folks, you know, when the last game's going on, you got 50 umpires there, and only three umpires get to work or four umpires get to work that last game, and you only have two or three behind there watching. Uh, you know, back in our younger days, we had 25, 30, 40 umpires watching the last game, and they were watching the umpires. So you can learn things. Uh, you're still in a learning mode, you know, like any other job, two to three years to really figure out what that job is. Uh, so you're still in a learning mode, uh, but you really should be reaching out and finding out more about your organization. It's an interesting theme that's arising here. Pete, what would you say to uh, to somebody who's at that five-year point in their career? What kind of advice would you give them? Well, as uh, Kevin said there, don't rest on your laurels. Keep pushing yourself to get better. Ask your mentor or your assigner how you can get those bigger games and what you need to do, how you need to improve so that you can get those better games. That's keep keeping learning. Um, Always remember that you're there for the game, not the other way around. Some people, when they get to a certain point, kind of see themselves as being bigger than the game. You're not. You're always an umpire. You are there for the players. Yep. Um, also, become a mentor yourself. If, if you've got five years in the game, you've probably got some advice you can pass on to the new people coming through. Um, see if you can help out with the training clinics in your region. Uh, I'm always astounded by when I help run a clinic or run a clinic. How much I still learn by teaching other people and answering their questions. Great points, Bob. What, what would you say to uh, an official that's in their fifth year? I would probably use another acronym, uh, Easy E A S Y. I just like those. I think Wayne Brown started me on using those things. Uh -huh. uh, e evaluation of self. I think five years, four or five, six years in umpiring. You need to go back and look at your motivation. Is it a part-time job still? Or are you now looking at things for yourself? That you see yourself moving forward, advancing? I mean, you always should be striving to be the best that you can be at any point in your career. But at some point, you may say, 
oh, this is, I can see a future for me in this. I like it. I want to stick with it. I want to go further. Um, and to do that, you really need to understand your organization's pathways. Your, your Softball Canada, USA Softball, so Softball Europe all have a pathway that you should follow to get to advance, to get to do national championships. And that should be your first goal. When I started, you know, my big hope was to do a league championship. You know, that's in second or third year. And after that, boy, could I get to a provincial, get to get out of my city and go somewhere else and stay overnight, have fun? Absolutely. And after that, well, gee, a national, that would be great to get. So I had to learn what it took to get to a Canadian national championship. I had to know what the pathways was and work at that. Two, A, as an easy, look for other opinions. Ask other umpires to evaluate you. Let them help you find out what you need to do. Um, you know, and work on that. So you have your own critical approach of understanding how you're umpiring, what you need to do to improve. And I'll ask others to help you with that so that you can become better. Um, set some realistic goals. You know, use the SMART principle. Keep them uh, specific, measurable, uh, attainable, relevant, and timely. And take it in small chunks. That's the S of easy. And the why and easy, have an action plan, your action plan that'll take you forward. It's not going to be the same as anybody else's because you're going to have other outside pressures that may affect the way that you proceed in your umpiring career, but have an action plan and put that into play. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, this one, I'll start with you. Um, I'm sure given the four of your experiences that you've had people that have approached you and said, you know, I, I think I want to represent the United States on the international stage. So what kind of advice do you give to somebody who has that goal in mind? You know, representing your country in anything from sports to whatever is phenomenal when you finally get to do it. When you're thinking about it, you're thinking about, boy, I want to go out there and I want to umpire and I want to do the best job I can do. Um, people that have always asked me, I've always tried to tell them, forget about where you're going, forget about what you're doing. Go back to what got you there. You're an umpire. You must be pretty good at what you do. Now you're going to represent your country. And now there's one bigger piece of pressure on you than just going out and umpire. And that's off the field because what you do off the field at an event when you're representing your country can mess up a career just as fast as what you do on field. Um, wearing your, I, I still remember being at a camp and it was a softball Canada lady. And she was in tears talking about all she wanted to do was wear that maple leaf. And of course, I went straight to hockey to try to take her off wearing about being a softball umpire. Um, and it just touched me pretty deep on what it meant to that lady to be able to go and represent your, your country. Uh, when you walk on that field, you're not only representing your country, but you're representing umpires. And you're meeting new umpires, you're meeting umpires from other countries. Um, so prepare yourself mentally that the pressure off the field can be just as much on the field, but the ride can be great. Thank you. Pete, what, what would you say to somebody who's contemplating a, an international career? What kind of advice would you give to that person? Talk to someone who's recently qualified internationally, someone who's gone through what you want to go through. It might not be what you think it is when you speak to somebody. Um, work the highest, game, highest level games you can get and concentrate on your game management. That becomes such an important part of the game, even more important part of the game. Something I think some people don't think about. You've got to a certain level in your game, in your region, you're top dog where you are. You're, you're the, the big man. As soon as you step up a level, you're right back at the bottom again. So be prepared to work very hard to move back up that, the rungs, if you like, of that uh, next level and gain the confidence of your peers and the players. Um, yeah, never, and 
I think it's always a big one. Never lose your enthusiasm and love for the game. It's why you're there. Uh, if you feel it slipping, if you feel like the, the reasons you're doing the job aren't quite there, take a step back for a little while. Just make sure that love comes back and then you can pursue the career a bit further. Thank you. Bob, what would you, uh, what would you tell that individual? Well, maybe another acronym. <laughs> Might as well be consistent. <laughs> Why not? That work. W O R K. Uh, w is work at your vocation. Continually strive to improve. To improve. Rural knowledge is so important at the international level. I mean, those cages, those coaches are playing for big stakes. They're astute on the rules, and they will use them to their advantage. You have to be able to keep up with them. Um, know your mechanics. Everybody has, every organization has little different mechanics. Understand and learn the international mechanics, the, uh, the WBSC mechanics. Uh, not a lot of big changes, but some that are important to know and to implement. Um, oh, obtain experience. Work as many games as you can at as many levels as you can. Uh, do games that challenge your skills. Work with better umpires so you can learn more. Talk to umpires who have been there at the international level. What was their experience? How did they get there? What did they like about it? What didn't they like about it? Um, R, reevaluate and be reevaluated on your on, on an ongoing basis. Game management is the big issue in international play. Pace of the game, working with coaches and players, understanding different cultures is so important. So you really have to work at that. Game management is so important. That's what evaluators look for at the international level. Do they have game management? Can they handle these situations that are going to blow up? And it might be a cultural blow up. It might be a rule interpretation blow up, or it might be a missed call. But you really have to know how to handle that working with international coaches and, and players. And finally, K, keep calm and be patient. I think someone mentioned that earlier. Don't be in a rush. Enjoy the journey. It's a long trip and have fun all the way along it. But don't try to rush to the end. Enjoy the journey. You'll get there. Just keep at it. Thank you. Um, so Caroline, what would what would you say to that individual that comes to you and says, I want to represent the Netherlands? Well, the first thing is the uh, the fact that I think before you can even think about representing your your country, you have to realize that you have to have a very a broad umpire resume. So um, work as many games as you as you can get, and also I think um, uh, in order to become an international and represent your country, you have to be you have to be a role model in your country and you have to be prepared to take on that role i mean we we easily talk about role models but you have to realize what that role means it means that you become the example for other umpires in your country the way you have looked at other umpires as an example for 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 your own um, um career i think that that is really important and um that we we do agree that game management especially in the top games is so important actually um where i i am very happy that we pay more attention now in our clinics our training to to that aspect of the game when 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 i started umpiring it was just about rules and mechanics and yes they are really important. I mean, I would love umpires who can, you know, the most, the most, let's say, rules, the most common rules that we come across that they can tell them to a coach verbatim. I mean, that makes such an impression and that gives you confidence. But the game management, that helps you through a game. And I think game management starts with self-management, with, with, with realizing that in order to to be the right leader in the game, you need some psychological skills. And it's not as if, you know, someone has them and someone else doesn't have them. No, these, some of those skills you can actually train. 
And I think it is really important that we talk about the psychological skills of the game as well. Like, you know, consistency in judgment, but also in how you behave yourself on the field, how you come across, how you handle your communication with players and coaches, um, how you work with partners. We all have partners that, you know, some of them we may work really well with, but others we may have an issue, but it is your job to make sure that you can cooperate with every partner that you have to work with as best as you can do. And I think those are, especially those psychological aspects of the game, I think are really important on that level. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Kevin mentioned something in his last response about, about the behaviors that umpires can engage in off the field that can um, help or hinder them. And that, that's actually my next question for you is in what kinds of, what kinds of things, you know, I, I think there's a wide variety of experiences out there that will listen to this either tonight or on a recording. And I'm wondering in your opinions, what kinds of behaviors or what kinds of things can umpires do that help or hinder their umpire goals? Pete, I'll start, I'll start with you this time. Oh, I think you're on mute, Pete. Pete. Okay. Um, <laughs> one of the things I, I learned probably the hard way. Oh, am I? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's a little no, choppy, but you're coming through. I'm not on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, can you no, you can out. Yeah, now we can hear you. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, it's, it's sort of game management again, but off the field game management. Um, be polite. If someone comes up to ask you some. Sorry? Okay. Be polite. Be, be approachable. Um, something that uh, what, whatever you say can be used out of context very easily, particularly these days with social media. So be very careful what you're saying when you're saying it. Um, don't you should never be saying derogatory things about the players or fellow umpires. Um, thank you. Um, that was a, I think we I think we caught the gist of that. Um, keep your comments very much to yourselves and to a very private environment. Right. Thanks, Pete. Uh, 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 you're just a little choppy, so I'm, gonna move to the, I'm just going to move to the next speaker while we're trying to. Um, people. Oh. Um, I, can do is give back to the game in whatever way you can. Um, we each have a different set of skill sets in, in life, in our work. So try and put back to the game, the game that's helped you get to you are um, by helping the game doing something basically for free. Okay, Pete, your your mic is it's very choppy, so I think I'm going to move to the next speaker if that's okay. Okay, so Bob, what would you do? What would you say to um, um, you know? How would you respond to that that question of what what can officials do that help or hinder their goals? Well, Frankie, sorry. You, you could uh, you could be positive in in whatever you post on social media. Uh, I mean, anything that you do negatively will always come back to bite you. And I think one of the things that umpires fail to realize is that different organizations have different policies 
and protocols around social media posting. So you need to know that before you go out there and put yourself on Facebook or, or Instagram or somewhere else while you're at a, at a tournament or a championship. Be very careful about what you do, uh, but never be negative about a championship, an organization, uh, another fellow umpire, a player, or a coach. I mean, it's great to talk up a game, uh, tell everybody you had a great game, uh, but be very careful. Don't be positive, not negative. The other issue that we had, and I think we've kind of got a little bit under control now, is umpires posting their assignments for the next day. And that, again, causes some concerns, uh, especially where something may happen on later on in the day that you might have to remove an umpire from a game uh, because of a conflict or a, a confrontation. So uh, that's one thing that we now uh, do not do not allow that the, the WBSC is, is to post uh, your, your assignments for the next day. So I think it's, it's keep it positive. That's, that's, the only, that's the key the key message, make sure everything's positive. And you could actually uh, probably extend that, not just from social media, but just to be positive off the diamond, right? Like yes, who Frank. wants to hang out with a negative Nelly? Seriously. Exactly, exactly Frankie. <laughs> Caroline, what, what, would, uh, what kinds of things would you say to somebody? Um, like what kinds of things have you seen over your time that have been like, wow, that's an amazing thing that person did to help their development or wow, that was really not a wise move to make on that person's part. Oh, wow. Um, well, actually I have an example. If, 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 I, if I may quote an example, I had an example once where I had um, um, a top game in the Netherlands and um, there was an umpire, an international umpire was uh, was in, in the umpire crew and he had just been to an international tournament, to a world championship. So he comes on the field and he says something like, oh my god, Caroline, are you still motivated for games like this? So um i actually took him out of the locker room outside and we had a very short but very harsh chat where i asked him to get his act together what well, all i'm trying to say is um even if you have become the international to represent your country always remember where you're from and always remember where your basis is and why you are doing this um and don't ever ever think um i'm there like okay now so now i'm an international umpire or maybe or not maybe even international but maybe you are assigned your first um national championship and you know you're so proud that's fine but don't ever think that this is it because we're talking about enjoyment um we're talking about um, the role of the umpire. Um, we're talking about the game. We are there to serve the game and no one is bigger than the game. So always remember that if you are not developing, if you are not learning at whatever um, level you are, you will stand still, so you will go backwards. And I think that is something um, that is very important. And then another thing that I have come across, and uh, I guess you too, the, uh, my partners here together with me on this panel is the so-called yes, but umpires. Um, these umpires that, yes, you're, you're all yes, but it sounds familiar, right? Um, so even if as an umpire, um you think that the feedback of your uic or maybe the feedback of your partner um may not be exactly what you want to hear or what you need at that moment just listen to it and reply in a way that is acceptable and don't always find excuses for things that um have things that you have done on the field. Admit to mistakes, as I said earlier, I think that is really important. Also for yourself, 
to get over it, to get them out of your system. Because we can be, as an umpire, you can sometimes you can feel really sick on the field because you made a mistake and you knew it. So better admit it after the game. Um, and yes, stay always um, when you find setbacks, you will find setbacks and disappointments when you're umpiring. Maybe you think that you have done a great tournament and you are really thinking that you may be assigned to the final, but you're not. You're getting an assignment maybe in the semifinal or maybe you're not working the last day. Um, that may be a disappointment, but always try to digest it and go back to, hey, why am I doing this? Oh, I love this. This is umpiring and this is where I belong. And then you continue and then you grow from getting over the disappointment. Thanks, Caroline. What about what about you, Kevin? Uh, well, Caroline, uh, uh, yes, but. Uh, boy, that was great terminology. And I know we've all heard it. And we've probably heard it more times than we w wish to hear it. But, um, you know, I like to get into somebody's head. I like to sit and listen and talk to an umpire and talk about other things other than an umpire and see where those umpires are really coming from, what they've got going on in their head. Because if they don't have what's really uh, 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 what we what we would consider concrete in their head, there's a, a lot of times we might think twice about putting them on a championship game or putting them on a final game. So when when you do sit and talk to a UIC or whatever, you know, share life experiences, but also remember where you're at. Don't sell yourself at the detriment of other umpires. Don't. Uh, disparage other calls. Don't spend time in a beer tent. Uh, stay away as far as you can from the beer tent because all you, in today's world, all you have to do is be near the beer tent and then somebody's going to come and say, Kevin was in the beer tent. And then you're going to have to explain why you were. Remember why you're there. You're there to umpire. Hang out with the umpire. And remember, if you go out to eat with the guys and the gals after the games are over with, remember, you've got games the next day. Uh, one of the best stories that we ever used to tell back in the day when I was umpiring, our UICs would not post the next day schedules until they were done with them. And in most times, that was 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And we had games at 8, 9 o'clock. And we always want to stay up and find out who was working and where, what, where, what games you were working, where you were working with. But when it was all said and done, when the schedule came out, those first three umpires had that first game. The rest of the group, some of the bet. Your time of sitting up, having a good time, joking around, having a beer, whatever was over. You need to go and get ready and get some rest for your next game. There are so many things, little bitty things in today's world that you can do that could really put a halt to your career, that you really have to focus on what you're doing. You know, in, in, in our world, in USA softball, uh, we have what's called safe sport. Um, and safe sport is literally something they put together to protect our, our children, to protect our players, to protect uh, anybody in the game. Um, and you can say the slightest thing nowadays and people will say, I wonder what they meant about that. The next thing you know, you're sitting in front of a bunch of people trying to explain what you were talking about. I think, uh, I don't know Caroline and Pete as well as I know Bob and, and Frankie and I use sense of humor a lot and I'd like to kid around, uh, but you need to be really, really careful when you're off the field as much as you have to be careful when you're on the field. Thank you. Such such great um, such great advice from from awesome people. Um, I just want to say to our audience members out there, if you have a question for the panelists or for someone specifically, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, you know, one of the things that was mentioned a number of times in your various responses was the idea of game management. So. Um, 
instead of having all four of you answer the same question, I think I'll split it two and two. And so what I think would be helpful for the audience would be to hear what kinds of things in your opinion demonstrate really good game management and what kinds of things do you see that demonstrate um, maybe not such great game management? I will let you decide which to answer what's good game management and which to and which to answer as you can tell I'm a single parent these days um, and which two would answer the latter if you want to ponder that because this is not a pre sent out question but I just thought since game management came up so frequently what kinds of things would an umpire do that actually demonstrate that they have great game management Kevin, Caroline, everyone looks like they're anxious. Okay, Kevin. Uh, I'll be glad to go. Um, to me, um, good game management is not how you handle the situation. Uh, good game management is how you prevent the situation. Um, and today's world, preventative umpiring has seemed to gone by the wayside. Uh, and our umpires are like, mm, you know, if they do this, we, we get to do this. And that just ends up blowing up into a big situation. Um, and also, I think a good umpire that can prevent problems on the field knows knows the teams that are playing from past histories, maybe. Um, watches and sees some of the things that happen during a game. A little nudge here and there, a little shoulder here and there, uh, a little uh, up foot that comes up on a slide and, and so you immediately all of a sudden think uh, okay better keep an eye on that um, in the men's game you know if a player gets hit by a pitch you know the next player is going to get hit you just know they are so prepare yourself so to me if, if to be a really good game manage, manager it is a lot about preventing what may happen versus handling what does happen you know, I you. agree with Kevin. I think that's uh, that's that's the biggest part of game management is to see what's going on, be aware of what's going on in the field, and then take the necessary steps to make sure that it doesn't doesn't become more than it should be. Uh, you know, good game management starts in the dressing room. A good pre-game brief with the with your crew members. Uh, good plate meeting with the coaches. Uh, let them know that uh, you're there to do the game. You're there to do your best. Uh, expect them to do their best. And then just be aware around the field. Keep the game moving. Keep a pace. Make sure that the players aren't running you, but you you are managing the game so that it's it's being played in a timely and efficient manner. And then, as Kevin says, keep your eyes alert. Uh, keep your ears alert. Watch for things that'll happen that might lead to something, and make sure that you act early to prevent it. Caroline, did you want to add something to that? Um. Well, as I said, I think game management starts with with self management. Be be aware of how you are being perceived. Um, be aware of your body language when you when you enter the field. Um, what what does your nonverbal communication? What what are you showing? Um, like. Um, in my case, I'm not too big, um, but when I put on the uniform, somehow, you know, the shoulders get a bit wider, the, I get a bit taller, and you have to to look the part, and that's 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 a good beginning. And I I really support um, what Kevin and Bob are saying by being preventive. You, and in order to be preventive, that requires that you can combine the, the focus that you need and the concentration that you need to you know, call these balls and strikes consistently. To, and you have to combine that with having the broader feeling and experience of what is going on in the game. So uh, this is experience, but again, this is also things that you can think about and that you can exercise yourself. Once you are aware of what is going on, um, you will be better prepared when some something tends to go wrong, especially like in the men's game, it's 
often possible to kind of feel the spirit of the game and just know, well, if I don't do anything now, it, something is going to happen. And the doing something, that is something also I think is important. I, I do like um, to stress here that you have to always um, act in your own way, in a style that suits you, that suits your personality. I mean, I can, I, I watch games as an umpire because I want to see where the umpires rotate and, and what they do. But if it comes to game management, you have to find your own style because what will work for Bob uh, to, to address a coach or to handle a player may not work for me. I have to find my own, my own let's say, strength that suits my personality. I think that is really important. Yes, yeah, such a such a good point. Um, and we're lucky in softball because I think that our mechanics and manuals give us an opportunity to have some personality. There are some sports that yes. struggle that struggle with that because they want the officials to look um, so similar. And then teaching the game management side is is challenging. But um, so Pete, we're going to see if your microphone's working a little better. And and I would like you to to um, so this game management piece. I'm wondering from a slow pitch perspective, if um, if like what does what does what does really good game management look like in a in a slow pitch game? Well, uh, all the uh, comments so far I've agreed with 100%. Body language is very important. Tone of voice can be important as well. If you approach a, a coach and your tone of voice is confrontational you can actually make the problem worse so you've got to try and have a neutral tone of voice to break down the problem and if if, if you can see it happening before if you can see the niggle happening before the problem gets too big a, a quiet word with a coach rather than an official word can often break down that whole thing down and stop it ever getting to a point where you have to take official action um, so the, the psych, um, something Caroline said, it's about yourself, the psychology of yourself, but it's also you have to try and understand the psychology of the coach. They're there to help their team win the game. So they're often doing things that they know they probably shouldn't. So you can, with your, using the game management, the body language, tone of voice and timing, talk to them and break that, that thing down and get them to stop inciting their team in some way that could lead to a bigger problem. Right. Good. Frankie, if I, if I may, I wanted to touch on one thing that Kerlin said. Um, you know, you try to teach game management and you try to teach different things, and we all know how to get from point A to point B. But all four of us are going to get from point A to point B in a different way. We're going to accomplish the goal, but we're going to get it in a, in a different way. And, and if you want to learn some of that, read a lot about some of the great umpires in their heyday and how they diffuse situations by different words. Uh, I read an, an article not too long ago about Joe West, who is a major league umpire, was one of the best of the best for many, many years. Uh, and he maintains he never missed a call. And of course, as an umpire, you know you're going to get questioned when you say you never missed a call. And his answer was, I was there. I didn't miss it. I might have got it wrong, <laughs> but I didn't miss it. I thought to myself, my Lord, could I have used that when I was umpire? <laughs> <laughs> Those are the kind of things I think you can learn by reading things or reading up on other people and the way they handle it. But you know, you still got to have your style to get from point A to point B. For sure. Um, I just, uh, I just, I don't know why I thought of this, but um, my very first blue convention that I attended, the keynote speaker was a, a, a famous woman from the United States, Emily Alexander. And, and I'll never forget that she talked about umpires that are at variety at a variety of points in their career and and for whatever reason they lose their light so she talked about this candle being lit that demonstrates our passion for the sport and the passion for what we're doing and she talked about what do we do when that when that passion when the candle goes out 
you know, what do we, what do we do? And, um, you know, I've, I've looked at the list of people who are, are attending tonight and we have some people that have, have been in our program for a long time and they've given lots of themselves. And I wonder, there have to be moments where people question, you know, should I stay? Should I, you know, what, what am I doing? What, what should I do next? And I'm, I'm wondering if the four of you have a piece of advice for people who may, what, what would you say to somebody who says, I'm just not really sure. I'm, I'm kind of feeling like I'm losing my passion and I'm not sure what I should do. Um, what kind of advice would you give for somebody in that situation? Especially those people that you think could still give back in some way, or they've already given so many, you know, years of service that you think, wow, it would be a shame for that person to, to, go, to go away from the game. Don't all, don't all jump at the question at once. <laughs> I think, Frankie, I would probably ask them to go back and look at their motivation. Uh, you know, why are you still umpiring? Are you still having fun? Are you enjoying the game? Have you reached some level of frustration because you didn't get where you want to go or you can no longer physically get where you want to go as far as umpiring on the field? And then, you know, have them look at other avenues that, that, that will keep them in the umpiring program. They can become instructors, uh, mentors, um, evaluators, all kinds of ways that they can stay involved. And, you know, tell them, you know, give it a go. Keep working at your game and maybe you'll, you'll find that passion back again. But, you know, there's certainly times in everybody's career where you suffer some burnout and, you know, you have to really look at yourself and say, why am I, why am I feeling that way? And what's what's wrong? What's not going right? And there's some things that you might be able to find uh, answers to or fixes for. But if not, if, if, if things have become to the point where being on the field isn't as much fun as it used to be, look at other avenues in the umpiring program uh, that you can contribute. Or... Um, you know, if they're early in their career and they reach that frustration and they feel they're done, uh, just try to find them other avenues to get back on track to go where they want to go. Um, so I think it's it's really something that that individual has to do themselves. They really have to look at themselves and say, what's wrong? Why am I doing this? Why did I start to do this? Uh, why is it no longer fun? And what can I do to, to change that? As an signers and and in selecting umpires to go to places, uh, we might be that wind that blows that candle out because we put them in a position to fail or we put them in a position uh, back to back to back to back to back working great tournaments, working great championships and just burn them out. Uh, you know, you, I, I truly believe you can only have so much inside of you every time you walk on the field. Um, I mean, I, I think sometimes we have to question ourselves to make sure we weren't the one to do that. And at the same time, I, I fully agree with what Bob said, is sit them down and, and, and talk to them and say, okay, wh where do you think you're going with this? I mean, do you think you want out of softball? Um, you know, I, I, I've been asked uh, right, wrong, or different, I guess, by a lot of people why I retired or when I retired or how I retired. And mine was pretty easy. A friend of mine told me I ought to retire, so I retired. Uh, I, my, my back was done. I couldn't umpire anymore. I couldn't umpire for a week, and I got asked to go to a, a big tournament. And I said, I don't think I can umpire a week. He said, well, maybe I ought to retire. I said, okay, I'll retire. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was lucky. I had a friend that would, you know, would, would tell me those things. Uh, I think we all have to take that step back somewhere in our career and say, okay, why am I asking these questions? Is it not fun anymore? If, if you've lost the fun, um, I, I would strongly urge whoever is asking those questions to, to try to find that fun again and get back to where you're having a good time and you're not worried, okay, am I gonna, am I gonna get to the next international assignment? Am I gonna get to the next, you know, the, the plate in the last day? Am I gonna, you know, no, go back out there and, and remember why you got started in the in doing umpire and it was because something that you really wanted to do and then question yourself you know do i have more to give and, and become become uh somebody like the folks on this on this panel because you can give so much back to the game i remember the first national championship game i did behind the plate i was like my lord this is a great feeling i would 
I triple that feeling every time I send an umpire to a tournament that I know they're going to succeed at. Uh, I get a, I get that same feeling. So you might that that candle might get be going out for the umpire part of it, but if you really think about it, it's probably not going out for the softball part. Of it. Caroline Peak, do you want to chime in on that one? Yeah, um, a bit of personal experience. I can't remember how many years ago it was. It was actually my first ejection, and for weeks afterwards, I felt really bad. I I, I actually contemplated giving up umpiring, and I it, it took a while of self evaluation, which is what Bob was saying. Um, I still looking at what what happened. It took me about two weeks, two three weeks to work this out. Um, I still, I still may say I got the right decision, but I should have avoided having to do it. I should have seen the problem building up and dealt with it in a better way before I had to uh, eject the player. So that advice, take some time, reevaluate, see what you're, you're doing, see how you could improve and carry on or choose another, another avenue, coaching, clinics, mentoring, um, any other form. Of activity that helps the umpiring program, but time and reevaluation, I think, is is the only advice I have. Thank you, Caroline. Did you want to? Well, I would wish that every umpire who who comes across such a situation where you don't where well the flame has gone, so to say, has can find can find the right people in there in the community that we talked about when we started off as a beginner, be a member of the community, that you still have this umpiring community around you where you are part of, and that you, um, of course, you have to reflect yourself on what is going on and, and, and why am I losing it? Why am I not liking it anymore? Um, but I think it is also really important to talk about it and it, to talk about it with people that you trust um, and with people that probably have gone to the same scenario in their umpiring career. So, uh, I mean, there's, so, so we all go through these uh, stages because the last thing anyone in umpiring would want is to go out of it with frustration. And not being happy when you say there's nothing wrong with saying goodbye at in the end i mean we all will probably go and say goodbye at one point in time i mean it's not as if we uh want to do this endlessly but i would always say never ever uh, allow yourself to quit in frustration because you always have to go back to why did i why did I start this and how come I did this for so long? I loved it for so long. I belong there. And of course, there can be a point where you don't belong anymore, but always with good feelings. You have to say goodbye in a good way, in, in a way that you feel that the circle is round, so to say. You know, um, that's what well, I would wish for everyone who goes through such a state, such a phase. Well, I really yeah. appreciate you all taking the time to answer that question because um, I just was looking again through the through the people who are actually here with us tonight. And there's people that are very near and dear to my heart that I know have struggled with that over their time. And of course, many of us in the country didn't get a chance to umpire last summer. So who's going to return to the sport who isn't going to return the sport and i think a lot of that will depend on the connections that they have with people who are still here and the relationships that they've built and people are going to have to reach out and pull people back in i think um and i i mean it's like and mental health is is has increased 38 percent you know with COVID and everything so i think it's just a challenging time for people so thank you for for taking a minute to answer that question my last question for each of you tonight is Looking back, is there anything that you know now that you wish you had known earlier in your umpiring career? And I, I apologize, Bob might not have enough time to come up with an acronym for. I, 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 certainly, <laughs> don't, 
Uh, he does. I'm hanging up. <laughs> I think if I if I look back, the the one thing that um, I never realized when I started umpiring was that uh, how much I would enjoy it, uh, but and how long, how much longevity that uh, would result in in my career, and I didn't realize that I would get this old so quickly. But uh, but it, it it's. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's been there's so many journeys, so many things that you learn, so many people you meet. Uh, but I think if you go back and look over your career, it's the people. It really is the people that you met and that you come to be friends with and to learn from and to enjoy their company, whether they have southern charm or not. Um, it's a <laughs> it's always a joy to talk to some people. So and uh, <laughs> you know with that. Those that have, I've been involved with on committees, um, they put so much work into things and made life so much easier for me. And it was easy to to see things uh, unfurl as a result of their big, their tremendous work. So it's been a, it's been a a joyful ride, and uh, I'm glad that I did it. Kevin, what about you? Wow. Um... There was a point in time in my career, uh, you know, going through umpiring that I'd say just about anything I wanted to to just about anybody. And some of those times I think back and I said, boy, I wish I'd have that back. It's, uh, I, I'm sure I was a little out of line at times. Um, you know, my daddy, my daddy taught me growing up that you could say just about anything you want to anybody as long as your timing and delivery was good. And I took that to heart, not only as an umpire, but outside of umpiring. And, and there, there are probably times that I probably would think back and, well, boy, I wish I hadn't told that story. But, uh, I, I'm like Bob. I, the one thing I think I probably would would have done a little differently is maybe got involved in this part of it a little sooner while I was still umpiring. Um, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't really pay attention to the. I didn't know what was involved so that I could put on a pair of black shoes, blue pants, and a powder blue shirt and go out and open. Had no worthy idea. And I, I might have enjoyed, the, uh, enjoyed some things differently uh, if I had, a, had paid a little more attention to that. But the, the, the ride as far as being an umpire and, a, and an umpire family, I, my Lord, I still get Christmas cards from Japan and people that I umpired world tournaments from. And, and there's nothing that will, uh, you know, uh, kind of make your heart beat a couple of extra beats when you when you get those kind of things. So, kind of like Bob, um, uh, it, it, it it's been a great ride. I, I've enjoyed every minute of it. There's probably a couple of times I should have kept my mouth shut a little bit more often, but uh, oh well, you, you can't rehash the past. <laughs> so, um, I, did, I, I, I doing things like this, uh, it, it's it, it's it's phenomenal that you know. Uh, little redneck kid from Memphis, Tennessee, would ever be doing stuff like this. So it's a great ride. So if anybody's out there listening, you can have a, you can have a great time doing this just as much as you're doing. Caroline? Um, well, actually, I don't want to think about the fact that maybe I should have had more self-confidence in the beginning of my career um, uh, because that, is, but, but that is true. That is a fact. Um, I was often way too too stressed, and it took a lot a, lo a lot of energy to uh, overcome that. So, but I actually, Frankie, um, no, I don't want to think about that anymore. No, when I think about my umpiring career, I think about a game in a world championship in Venezuela in somewhere in the middle of the week between Venezuela and, and Czech Republic where I was, it was the fifth inning and the game was amazing. And I, I knew I, I was really in the game. I felt awesome. And, you know, there was like a huge crowd. The ambience was terrific. And it was in the fifth inning. And 
Um, I was like, after the third out, I was in my position as a plate umpire along the line. And I thought to myself, my God, am I privileged and happy to be here? It was such an awesome moment. And that is what I want to keep in my mind always. Nice. There's lots more moments, but that's the one. Thank you. Pete? Uh, what everyone else has said so far, I completely agree with. Um, I was doing a game in Sofia in Bulgaria with uh, a, the Canadian exchange umpire. And it was one of those games where everything just seemed to go right. We, we enjoyed, we, we clicked. We did it every time we looked up, the other one was looking. And we came off the field and in unison, we turned to each other and said, that was fun. And that's the thing I didn't know when I was started umpiring. It could be so much fun. And I would be umpiring with someone from Canada in Bulgaria and having a, a, a great time. Um, someone once said to me, as an umpire, you have the best seat in the house. You see some brilliant softball. You're honoured to see that brilliant softball from yeah. There's no camera where you are, so we're very privileged to get to get that seed. Right, Pete. There's a question in our chat from Mark Goff about whether or not the ejection you spoke about was at a Canadian Championship. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Oh, for some reason, you're, uh, we can't hear you. No, it wasn't Mark. Okay. That's good. I didn't want Mark to think he'd been a part of your big moment. <laughs> I know what the game he's talking about. No, no, it wasn't. So this, I do have a question in the chat from, um, oh, from somebody um, for the oh, fast dude. pitch people. Um, Knowing the rules of softball can eliminate many on-field issues with coaches and players. I feel there's never a bad time to talk rules. Umpires can study the rule book, but talking game situations between umps and the correct rule that should be enforced is invaluable. How does the panel support their umpires to learn and implement the right call in our fast-moving game of fastball? Panel. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Okay, uh, I started up in 1980. That's when I read the rule book. Second time I read the rule book was 2006 when I took this <laughs> job. Over. Uh, uh, I I was one of those guys that always go, okay, well, okay, I got somebody with me that knows the rules. I'm in good shape. Um, but when that was all said and done. Um, the one thing I learned in a hurry about rules was the first state championship I ever worked in the state of Michigan. And I went to my mentor and who was one of the writers of softball rules from way back at softball mechanics by the name of Bill Humphrey. Um, probably one of the best fast pitch people ever to be involved in the game. And I asked him a question about a rule and he said, well, what'd you call? And I said, I called this. He said, where'd you find that in the rule book? And I said, well, I didn't look in the rule book. And he said, never answer a rule question without quoting a rule number and a rule reference number. And I said, okay. I said, did I get it right? And, they, and I, he said, no, you missed it. Here's what you should have said. And I said, okay, great. Thank God it was only league play. And he proceeded to plant his fist in my chest about five times at a moderate speed with a with a pretty good thump and say umpire every game like it's a national championship and learn the rules like it's a national championship yes and i yes. i took that to work. um but I, I i do think it's invaluable as long as and i'm going to go back to something that caroline said earlier you're with a group of umpires, you don't get a bunch of yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Listen to the other people because our rules also have a, a, a you know, it, it's called a rule book for a reason. It's a book of rules that 
there may not be just one rule that for that specific situation. Uh, and you need to learn to apply all of them to the situation you're trying to talk about. If I, can, if I can add to what uh, Kevin was saying, uh, I think it, for umpires, uh, knowing the rules is one thing, understanding the reason for that rule is another thing. Uh, so very important to understand why that rule is in existence. And if you can understand the rationale behind the rule, then you can better um, apply the rule in, during the game. I think that's so important. And I think there's a lot of common sense in the application of rules that, that you can't write out. And as Kevin said, can't write a rule to cover every situation. But if you have a general gist of the un and understanding of what the rules are trying to accomplish and the rationale behind the rules around those kinds of situations, you come up with the right answer. Uh, Caroline? Yep. Well, I agree with Bob and Kevin so far. I mean, uh, that's 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 nothing much, nothing much that I can add, except probably that whenever in a game and almost in every game this occurs, you have a situation where something happened and you had to say something about rule, make a decision on a rule, or your partner made a decision on a rule, talk about it afterwards, and in case of doubt, just check it out. I mean, talk about it together um, and check out the rule book. And we have, I mean, in this day and age, we as an umpire, you have so many opportunities to watch games. I mean, live, but especially also on video, um, watch games, uh, work case plays. Um, but the most important thing is, I think, um, understanding what Bob is saying and knowing how and when to apply the rules um, and that is of course that comes with experience but that also comes with um, having the the discipline and the perseverance to be constantly aware that, that you can improve on this right. by talking about it by asking questions by asking interpretations right that's yeah that's Thank you. I, I don't know the um, I don't know the individual who asked the question, but I am uh, hopeful that um, that addressed the intent of the rule is key and is not something that we listen to in our clinics, but is valuable to understand this aspect of our game. Yes, thank you for that comment, and I'm I'm hopeful that um, that the responses that Bob, Kevin, and Caroline provided addressed. Um, the question that you asked, Ron. I don't. I don't know you, so nice to meet you virtually. Um, but uh, I do. I do appreciate the um, the theme kind of that's weaving its way through here. Is like you kind of have to have some knowledge, which comes from the rule book. But some people are real practical learners, and so their game experience is really helpful. But when you don't know if you've done something correctly or not, you should probably chat with somebody. And to Kevin's point, everybody has said, you know, watching other officials and, and watching them adjudicate and enforce the rules is also um, really helpful. I think that we've addressed all the questions in the chat. Um, oops, let me just see here. How much do you use? How much do you, sorry, the chat, the, it's really tiny. How much do you use video to train, improve umpires in your various organizations? From my point of view, not enough. Uh, we're just getting into that. Um, and you certainly need some technical skills to do that. But certainly use of videos is very good for evaluations. It's very good for explaining rules. And it puts it on a, a level playing field for everybody to understand if you can use proper videos. I think some of the issues with videos is that sometimes we capture uh, video that is not as accurate or as good as we would like and it gets used in clinics. But I certainly think videos play a role in the education of umpires, absolutely. Caroline, are you using video over in Softball Europe to teach clinics or run seminars? Um, well, actually, yeah, we're, we're piggybacking on what is available uh, from, uh, from, for instance, from WBSC. Um, we don't have a video base um, in Europe, although we are developing some. We, um, we do um, 
we do point out to umpires that, for instance, some of our games in European championships are recorded. So um, we review those. Um, and we, what we also do is we work with UICs to, uh, we ask our UICs to, let's say, watch a game and ask them to, to watch the umpires, see what they pick up from the umpiring so that they can share like, like feedback, but not as Bob says, also in Europe, we don't do it enough. We're still in the early stages of, of developing this tool. Yeah. Pete, do you guys use video over in the UK? There we go. Let's see if you're with us here. Nope. Kevin, how about you give it a whirl? You guys using video down in USA? Uh, you know, uh, I, I would agree. Uh, one of the things Bob said, probably not enough. Um, the one thing that um, if we'd like to give COVID a pat on the back uh, and it's caused is I think when you're virtually training, you, you, you better learn to use video. Um, we're, we're lucky in that we stream all of our uh, national championships, uh, I say all of them, most of our national championships. Uh, we are now doing uh, similar, something that Caroline said is uh, we, we have the ability to, to tag a play so we could say, hey, first inning, bottom of the, uh, you know, bottom of the first, two outs, run on second base, um, you know, tag that play for me. And, um, uh, we're able to, to uh, I've got a couple of guys on my staff that could pull it out of a, a stream video. Um, so much, so much so that we have in our, we've had two national virtual national umpire schools that we've used video uh, and to uh, help train not as much on rules uh, as probably mechanics, um, you know, interference obstruction, you know, you can, you, we've got some stuff on it. And we are actually developing a, a uh, video casebook. Uh, National High School Federation asked us uh, here in the States to, de to develop one. Well, their rules and their mechanics are the same as ours. Uh, so we thought, hmm, why don't we put one together now? The difference being it's going to be a casebook on mechanics, not a casebook on rules. Uh, it'll be more video, but um, and I hate to keep bringing it up, but the video can sure put an end to the yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. When you show them on video, they, <laughs> well, you weren't standing at first base, you're all the way over third base. Here, here you are in the video, you know. Uh, uh, so it can help. It, it, it not only helped train, but uh, we use it a lot uh, now to help evaluate. Yeah, I know. Um Basketball, I officiate basketball as well, and, and I know softball maybe isn't there yet, but uh, basketball is, they have one evaluator whose pure job is just to take video during the games, so that when they go into the room after, the head evaluator will say 314 first quarter, and they go right to 314 of the first quarter, they show the crew the play, and then they can talk about it. Wow. Um, Frankie, yeah. let me just add this for, for Pete. I know that the Great Britain Softball Federation is creating some very good uh, training videos for sloping. Yes. Uh, they've started, uh, I think, with the strike zone and they're, they're moving to mechanics and to rules and it's really good animation and, uh, you know, actual uh, video. So it's, uh, right. it's a, a nice, nice piece of work. Right. And, and this is also something that's come out of COVID is this, um, you know, yep. international collegiality. So Pete, I think your colleagues have touched base with Jeff Whipple and, and Scott McLaren on the ODC to, to sort of parlay some of that work into some videos I know that Scott's working on. So it is something that Softball Canada has been looking into too. Um, I think one last question that we have in the chat um, is... How does one learn the intent of the rules? That'll be the last question that I'll pose for you for this evening. Whoa. Well, if you're a real historian, you go back and look when the rule was first introduced to the Federation, which would have a rationale around it. 
Uh, other than that, talk to umpires and say, why, why do we do that? Why do we have an infield fly rule? What's the rationale behind that? You know, what's the purpose of it? But the, the true way to do it is really do the historical research and go back and look at the rule as it was introduced to a federation and see what the rationale was for bringing that rule in. Some of the rationale is not always that good, but at least you understand where the room came from. Well, I, would agree, I would agree with Bob 100%. <laughs> uh, we're, we're lucky, I don't would. Um, we've got, uh, you know, several of the folks that were involved with ASA softball way, way, way back when the rule books first came out. Um, and I'm, I'm able to pick up the phone and call them and saying, okay, you know, you got to help me here. Why, oh, where did this rule come from and why is it there? Especially when you see, uh, and, and probably by printing errors or whatever, and you know, 1994 was this, and then 2007 it's this, and it's totally changed and nobody talked about making a rule change or anything else. So, you know, uh, uh, one of the best ones that we've talked about very frequently is pitching rule. Um, you know, and it's always been explained to us, it's a process, you know, if you follow a process, regardless of what they do in between all that, if they're following the process, then it's probably not a legal type of, of conversation. Um, you know, with the, the intent, what was the intent of calling something obstruction? You know, uh, those things are hard to understand, uh, but the, one of the better other ways you can do it is not only study the history, but if you look at the rule book again as a whole book, not just there's a rule in there that says if a ball is hit and it hits a runner, that's interference. Okay. Yeah. But then there's several other areas that say different things about interference. So if you put them all together, a lot of times you can figure out the intent by yourself. Perfect. Here, I think, I, yeah, I guess, I guess you, as an umpire, you have, let's say, two sets of rules. There's the rules that that are important when the game is being played, you know, like obstruction, interference, um, hit by a batted ball, whatever. And there are the, those administrative rules. Well, the administrative rules are just rules that you, I mean, those are the the hard ones. I think the ones that you have to know, you know, like with. Uh, substitutes and stuff like that but uh, the obstruction interference type of rules those I think it will help the intent of those rules will help you a lot it will help you a lot when you as an umpire also understand the game of softball and understand how the game and for pitching for instance how the game has developed and I, I think if if you understand if you understand and always think about the fact that those rules are there for the balance in the game between defense and offense so sometimes when you don't even know the rule by heart a situation happens and thinking about what bob also said the logical intent of the of the rule that may help you to apply it in the correct manner thank um, you pete sorry Let's see if your mic's working. Dude, you're having troubles tonight. <laughs> oh, there we go. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Pete, it's really I was going to mention the case. I was going to mention the case book as well. There's, we, we have very good case books which put the rules into an example. So you can, from that, you can see some of the intent. Exactly. Oh dear. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, I yeah, think the, the, the case book. So the, I think the thing I love about that question is, um, when you're teaching the first year class of umpires, the rule book is very daunting. And so I think uh, the intent of the rule is easiest if you if you ask your first year class to think about think about the rules as a player. 
right? This is why sometimes yeah. players make our best officials because they understand the game. And if they've played at a very competitive level, they actually also understand the spirit behind the rules. So there's a recruitment, you know, we should be recruiting ex players to come and officiate. Um, Frankie, that's, that's the reason I only read it once. <laughs> and I found it very daunting after I read it. I was like, I'm not gonna remember all this. So. Well, exactly. It's it's pretty, it's pretty unbelievable. So I just want to thank the um thank the participants for coming, for asking questions, for your kind comments in the chat box for the panelists. And I'd like to thank Donna Zarko for all of the administrative support that she's providing in the background. And to Bob Stanton, Caroline Studhowers, Kevin Ryan, and Pete Saunders, thank you so much for your time this evening. I can personally say that I, I could spend hours chatting with you all about, um, about softball, and I feel so fortunate to have had the pleasure of spending some time with you tonight. Um, are there any parting comments that any of you wish to share? No. Well, I, I just say thanks for having me. I really um, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you, yeah. Frank. Thank you, other panelists. It was an uh, enjoyable evening. Enjoying learning. I learned some things that I didn't realize. Uh, so you're always in a learning mode when you, when you get a group of top officials in, in the room or even not so top officials. But as long as I, think, umpiring. I think you could probably tell your folks too that are on here that if you really want to know how to understand softball, that both Caroline and, and, and Pete, or it's like two or three o'clock in the morning for them. And their mind is still working in the world of softball. That is, that's that's unfathomable to me. Thank you guys. Thank you, Kevin, Bob, Pete, and last but not least, thank you, uh, Frankie, for the invite. I mean, I feel, I mean, it was a privilege to be here and to share with these guys. It was a, Great fun, yes. And I Thank hope you. all the attendants really enjoyed. And um, oh, I can show you the, uh, the comments that are coming in are are really um, really quite uh, quite positive and heartfelt. And and so I know that everybody enjoyed it. And there's uh, lots of people who will watch it afterwards. So and there's there's questions that are kind of popping in, and I'll, I'll probably. Um, try to address them as uh, yeah just lots of thanks and uh, big hugs great job so uh, thank you to all the panelists for their words of wisdom <laughs> um, so Frankie one question that, we, that didn't get asked I yeah. think that should be asked sure how old, how old is your son oh five he was cute thank you yeah. um I actually was just having a moment like my first world championship he was 11 months old and he was with me because uh I, like he was just at that point where I still needed him around he still needed to be around me quite often so yeah I can't believe it it's already five is he calling games yet sort of <laughs> <laughs> sort of I don't um, know one of the one of the presentations, one of the presentations that we're putting on 